I'll send it. Okay. Is yes, now we see the whole thing. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry to sorry to do that at the beginning of the talk. All right. Uh, okay. So sorry about that. Um, let me continue. Um, so down at the bottom, there is a uh, sort of a circle there, and that is a, um, sort of the alignment of um, a bunch of grass genomes. This alignment was done by Galen Devos in 1998. Um, in a PNAS paper, and it was one of the first ways we kind of began to look at genomes beyond just like a single genome or a single species. So um, let's see, can I advance here? All right, so what is a pangenome? A pangenome represents the full complement of diversity within a clade or the union of all genes or SNPs across a representative selection of genomes. Okay. So why, why would um, people want to make a pangenome? Well, um, it turns out a single reference genome doesn't really represent the diversity within a given species. Um, also, advances in sequencing technology and lower costs have made generating a pangenome a feasible goal for many research groups now. Okay, so the first pangenome was Sacro, uh, no, Streptococcus agalactiae, and it's a microbial pangenome. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing. Uh, it was released in 2005. And it was comprised of eight genomes, um, sequenced at 8x coverage, each genome about 1.8 megabases in size. Uh, the whole genome alignments were done using the Mummer alignment program, and gene sequence similarity was determined by translated protein sequence comparisons. And so what you're looking at here is um, these, basically each, you'll see eight panels here, and each panel represents a case where one of the eight genomes was used as the reference in comparison to the others. The colors represent the, uh, the, the coordinates from the beginning to the end of the chromosome. So yellow would be the beginning of the chromosome and that dark blue would be the end. Uh, wherever you see these uh, colored spaces that are the same in any particular reason, region, that, refer that represents the reference in each case sharing sequence similarity in the same syntenic position across all accessions. Wherever you see white, that's the reference lacking sequence similarity to other accessions. And where you see the color is different in comparison to the, the colors flanking it, as in this uh, blue box, that is um, when the reference sequence share sequence similarity in some accessions, but not in the same syntenic position. So in comparison to a microbial genome, there is a recent pan genome that came out in rice, came out this year, and it comprises a pan genome data set of the uh, reference Oriza sativa, japonica, to the Oriza rufopogon species complex. Now each, now in comparison to the microbial genome, the rice genome is approximately 430 megabases in size. And on the left is a phylogenetic tree of all the different um, rice genomes that they compared. Now they de deep sequenced to 115x, 66 divergent accessions of rice into contigs. These contigs were anchored to the reference genome using the Mummer alignment program. And predicted genes and contigs were aligned against the reference genome with BLAST to determine presence absence of um, the genes in these various genomes. Now, I'd like to talk about an upcoming, uh, a future um, pan genome. This is the maize nested association population. And this is comprised of 25 diverse inbred lines plus the reference line B73. And on the right is sort of a 
phylogenetic tree that was generated by David Huffnagel in Matt Hufford's lab at ISU. Um, so all of these, all 25 of these complete genomes are currently being sequenced, assembled, and annotated by the NAM Sequencing Consortium, which is made up of Matt Hufford at ISU, uh, Doreen Ware at Cold Spring Harbor, and Kelly Daw at the University of Georgia. Each genome in maize, as in comparison to rice and uh, streptococcus, is two gigabases in size. And ultimately, there will be a whole genome alignment among all these different maze lines to create the pan genome. So here's some examples of species with existing pan genomes. The human pan genome exists in several different formats. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of microbial pan genomes. As indicated before, the microbial pan genomes, the microbial genomes are very small, so it's very easy to make pan genomes of these species. There are many crop pan genomes, though for the most part, they entail resequencing efforts, which means that uh, short reads are sequenced and then mapped against the reference. Not in all cases, but in many cases. And here's some crops that have pan genomes. That includes pepper, soybean, rice, as we just showed, wheat, and then maize. And again, the, the current maize pan genome is, um, there is some resequencing, but there are also like a, about two or three um, sequenced genomes that went into making this pan genome. There are not, I did not find a lot of animal or insect pan genomes. And so unfortunately, I really am only going to be focusing on, on crop pan genomes in this um, talk. So, okay. Come on. It's not advancing. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about some methods of creating a pan genome. Let's see. I don't know why it's not advancing. Sorry about this. I think, okay. So um, usually the comparisons done to create a pan genome include, oh, wow, sorry, my screen is just not advancing here. I don't know what's going on. Okay. The, the keystrokes don't work either, the arrow buttons? No. Oh man. All right, so, um, uh, Creating a pan genome, I talked about the case, three cases where whole genome alignment was used. And that's basically BLAST. Mummer is like a BLAST type of situation where you align the sequence of the genomes to each other or to a reference, um, or you align short reads to a reference sequence. Um, I'm gonna focus on pan genomes that are um, whole genome alignments, and instead of just using small base pairs as the unit, I'm going to be focusing on genes as the unit. So uh, there are three main features of a pan genome. One of them is the core genome. And the core genome is made up of genes present in all accessions in the pan genome. And this is represented um, in this picture by these sort of brown boxes. Those represent uh, core genes. And as you can see in accession one, accession two, and accession three, these sort of brownish uh, regions are in all three accessions. There's also what's called the dispensable genome. There's several different terms for this, but dispensable is one that's commonly used. These are genes that are present in some, but not all accessions in the pan genome. And these are represented by these uh, blue rectangles with a D in them. As you can see, uh, the one on the, on the right um, is in accession one and in accession three, but not in accession two. Conversely, the ones on the left, um, in accession two and accession three, they are shared, but not in accession one. And in accession two, they're actually duplicated. The third category are orphan genes, or otherwise known as lineage-specific genes. These are genes that are found only within a particular accession and nowhere else. So as you can see here, accession one has this green O 
but no other accessions do. And down at the bottom is a pan genome that uh, attempts to represent the, uh, all the genes that are found within these three accessions. So now we're gonna get into different types of pan genomes. The most common one and the most easy one to create is a referenced-based pan genome, and this is when all accessions are mapped to a single reference. Now, these, are, these types of pan genomes are very fast and easy to make, and they can also be represented as a FASTA file as a consensus sequence. The cons are they do not represent genes that are present in other accessions but missing in the reference. So down here, for instance, you have accession one and accession two, and then our reference in red. Now, uh, you can see that the Ds and the Cs, for the most part, have a, uh, a representative in the reference, but the O, the orphan gene, does not. So um, when you make your pan genome, in this case, that orphan gene would not be represented in this pan genome. Conversely, you can make an all against all pan all pan Okay, what's going on there? Okay, um, so the pan, this type of pan genome includes the total diversity of all accessions studied. So the pros of this, of course, it contains the total diversity among all accessions, but the cons are it can't be easily represented as a FASTA file. It's very slow to compute these and it uses a lot of CPU. Um, for the different kinds of pan genome formats, as I referred to before, there's the consensus FASTA file pan genome. And this is where all variation across accessions are collapsed into a consensus sequence, as you can see below. This case uh, is a representation of a pan genome that is outside of um, the species level. And this is a comparison of sorghum, ceteria, rice, and pineapple. And you can see highlighted in yellow are where uh, base pair changes have occurred across these four genomes. And down at the bottom is the consensus sequence. And in red uh, are the uh, bases that are represented more in, in among all these different um, lines. So this can be used for either SNP diversity or whole genome alignment against a reference sequence. Um, the nice thing about this is it's blastable and alignable. So you can create this pan genome and then reuse it for new and incoming pan genomes. Um, the problem with this is it's hard to represent large regions of variation, like for instance, insertions and deletions of like tens of KB. And it's also difficult to represent this as an all against all pan genome. So uh, another way of representing pan genomes is the graphical format. Um, this is where variation is represented as a graph with nodes and edges. Shared sequence similarity is collapsed into a single node. So as you can see down here in the pan genome, um, going back to using brown as our representative for core or shared um, information, you can see that among accessions one, two, and three, the sequence is the same. So in the pan genome, the sequence will be clapped into one node, and a node down here is this little rectangle. And the same thing with this other core gene on the right, or this core sequence. Um, and then differences in sequence that, like if a run of sequence is, is shared among accessions, but there are changes in, or differences in the base pairs, those would be represented in sort of like this bubble type conformation. And then uh, a run of sequence that's not in any of the other accessions except for one accession will have its own node off by itself that's not connected to um, anything else or collapsed. <clears throat> so this is really a, a useful format. It can be used for all types of pan genomes. Um, and it can also represent large regions of diversity better than a FASTA file. Can I ask a question, is, Maggie? I, sorry for interrupting. I'm looking at the second bubble there. Uh-huh. So my understanding is that 
this pan genome representation of the graph is that you could traverse the graph and get your genome. Um, but the accession two can't bypass this, the, the two blue boxes in, at the end. Okay. So would there be a line through the middle that bypasses them? You know, this, yeah, we can talk about this later. I'm just, I just wanted to do a really quick representation of the different types of formats, but um, yeah. Um, the CS person and me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a complicated topic. Maybe we can talk about it later, but um, yeah. Um, so the problem with this kind of pan genome, it's not really blastable or alignable. So once you create it, it's really hard to take incoming genomes and add on to it. Uh, I know that Ed Buckler's lab at, uh, in Cornell is working on a way to uh, make a graphical format that you can then convert to a FASTA file and make it alignable. But as you can imagine, it's rather complicated and that's still in the works. So, um, among the levels of pan genomes, there are species specific pan genomes, and these are cultivars within a species, and that's the most common pan genome that's usually generated. Uh, there are also genus specific pan genomes, and these are closely related species within a genus. There can also be family specific um, pan genomes, like the species within a family, like sort of like that grass circle image that I had in the first slide. Um, higher order clade pan genomes are possible, but the complexity increases as you go up in clade since the number of shared genes declines. So on the left here is a simplified phylogenetic tree comparing um, some species in the monocots and dicots. Um, at the top is sorghum, and then uh, ceteria, which is foxtail millet, and then rice, and those uh, make up the grass family. And then as an outgroup, there's pineapple. And then among the dicots, you have two clades, the rosids, which is represented by peach here, and the asterids, which is represented by tomato. So as you can see, you can see that ceteria is more closely related to sorghum. Um, rice is more closely related to sorghum than pineapple. And as you go to the dicots, peach and tomato are the most distantly related species to sorghum. The table on the right shows um, species and um, then their number of syntenic orthologs in sorghum. So Ceteria has 31,142 syntenic orthologs to sorghum. Rice has 28,406 syntenic orthologs. Pineapple has about 16,000. Peach has 5,000 and tomato has about 1,100. So as you can see, as you get more distantly related, the number of syntenic orthologs declines. So there's some challenges of creating um, whole genome, pan genomes for complex genomes, such as uh, maize and wheat. Maize and wheat have undergone recent polyploidy events. They have large inversions and translocations relative to their outgroups and contain a great number of repeat elements. Uh, these genomes also contain a large number of duplicated genes in cis and trans. And they've simultaneously undergone a great deal of gene deletion relative to outgroups. So therefore creating pan genomes to represent the extent of the diversity in these species is very daunting. And here's an example of what I mean. So this is two different, actually, two different maize inbred lines compared to the reference maize line B73. This is a uh, graphic that was outputted by Koji, the comparative genomics um, platform. And let me walk through this uh, figure with you. So um, these orange regions are blast hits from B73 um, to one of the other inbred lines called W22. And you can see in, in one of these cases, there's a line connecting these blast hits. Um, the brown regions are blast hits from B73 to another inbred line called MO17. And uh, you can see some connections here between the brown um, blast hits to these genes down here. These little regions here are gene models where the green and the blue are, 
And these rectangles encompass the DNA sequence and chromosome coordinates as in chromosome start and stop. Down here in this blue bubble is a tandem array. You can see that uh, these genes, um, there's several different genes here and they're all uh, um, aligning to one gene in B73. And that is a, a clear indicator that this is a tandem um, duplication in MO17 relative to B73. So what I want to direct your attention to are these genes that are circled in red. You can see that there are no colored regions above them anywhere. This indicates that these genes have no syntenic ortholog to B73. And the ones in B73 have no syntenic ortholog to either W22 or MO17. Now these are all uh, maize cultivars, ZMAs. And you can see that already just in this region, there's a, there's a, 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 a pretty like, impressive um, difference in um, gene presence absence just within this one, um, just within one species. So um, the point of this talk really is to um, discuss what the role of biological databases is in curating pangenomes. Um, biological databases will need to address nomenclature rules for pan genes, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and AgBioData is in a unique position to direct and standardize you know, naming conventions for pan genes at this early stage in you know, crop pan genome development. And I think our understanding of the complexity of this topic can help to inform us as to the best nomenclature conventions to implement. So um, another issue is storing pangenomic data in a public database. Uh, some of the questions we will be coming across is what types of pangenome formats can we store? How would we connect the functional data, like the expression data, mapping and marker data, and SNP data to the pangenome in a useful manner? So I'm going to give an example of um, some approaches that Maze GDB is thinking of in tackling this issue. And I'm gonna go back to the uh, NAM nested association mapping founder lines, which I discussed in an earlier slide. Maze GDB is soon going to be hosting these 25 genomes. And we're in the process right now of working on the most efficient way to do so. And here are some thoughts that we have. We're still working on it actually, so these aren't even written in stone. Um, one of them is to store all gene models among the NAMs that have an ortholog in either B73 or at least one other NAM line as determined by the NAM sequencing consortium in a single gene model page. Now on the right is an existing um, screen cap of an existing page in MazeGDB of the gene Ligulus 1. And as you can see here, it currently shows all the syntenic orthologs um, to Ligulus 1 in all these different um, existing maze assemblies right now. Like, uh, well, there's a B73, and there's a B104, EP1, F7, this is all listed on the right. So we are considering having pages like this for the, uh, for the NAM line gene models for cases when the NAM um, gene models are orthologous to each other. These pages will also contain mapping and functional data associated with the NAM loci, as well as the B73 gene model, if there is a B73 gene model associated. And then orphan NAM gene models will have their own page because they won't have any um, syntenic or orthologous data shared with any of the other gene models. So regarding nomenclature, uh, some of the ways we're thinking of approaching this is um, the NAM gene models will be given a PAN ID. For example, Z0123456. And then all NAM gene models that do share orthology will share a single PAN ID. So to summarize, there are various ways of representing a pan genome. 
Pan genomes can be very complex in certain species. And biological databases will need to determine how to assign pan IDs, what sorts of pan genome formats to host, and the most efficient way to host the pan genomes. And with that, I'll take questions. Well, that's, thank you, Maggie. That's awesome. That's a lot of work. <laughs> How many other uh, how many other people are dealing with this in their communities? I know a lot of you are muted, but um, how many other people are dealing with pangenomes right now? Soybean is. Mm -hmm. Are you taking a similar approach? Uh, we're talking about a lot of the same issues. Um, it looks like we'll be doing it at the G level and uh, our approach will be to place each the, the, the gene models from each assembly onto every other assembly and then derive a table of the correspondences. Um, so that'll give a union uh, there are about 50, 55,000 genes in soybean, so the, the union might be, you know, 60,000. <clears> and um, the approach will be similar to what you described, Maggie, towards the end uh, with, the, with the gene page. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, each gene will have between, let's say, one and six uh, genes. <clears throat> Uh, the, those with six being the core set. There's also a uh, Brachypodium project at JGI uh, under John Vogel. Oh, cool. Um, there's a, a website at, uh, I think it's called brachypan.jgi.doe.gov about it. Hi, this is Rashmi. I have a question. Sure. Yeah, so you showed there could be two ways of having a pan genome. One is the consensus faster sequence, another one is the clade one, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any example of the clade one? I don't know, I have not seen. Okay, so uh, actually the human genome, uh -huh. uh, they have represent, they have ways of representing uh, the the human genome as the uh, graphical format. Okay, so how do they use that? Well, I th that's a good question. It's, it's, I'm not really sure how they do that. I can give you one example that I know of where I, I, I do know how, they're, how they use it. I referred to Ed Buckler's uh, graphical format. Um, he calls it the practical haplotype graph. Now, um, the sequence is actually stored in a database, okay, uh -huh. SQL database. Oh, okay, got it. And then what happens is if you want to get the sequence of the pan genome in a usable FASTA format, uh, you can convert the uh, database to a, a VCF file. Uh -huh. And then you can take the sequence that will, and that VCF file will represent the, the very large indels, and then you can turn that into a FASTA file. So that's what he's working on now, and he's he's got that down uh, in terms of doing the sequencing and whatnot. And he's there, that his group is working on expanding that to like store the very very large indels between like maze and eventually being able to turn that into a FASTA file. Does that make sense? Yeah, I will see more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely welcome. Uh, hi, this is Sushma from Oregon State University. Maggie, it was a great talk, and I learned a lot about pen you know. Oh, good. Thank and, you. Uh, we are also putting together a document under egg biodata on pen genome, genome assembly, and so uh -huh. And so I and Lisa, we thought of inviting you and leading that section. 
I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, so that is one part. And the second part is, uh, I think that if you consider maize or rice or any other species, uh, perhaps the pen genome at the species level is going to be quite complicated by itself. Yes. Uh, perhaps it will have dozens, couple of dozens of uh, genomes under that. And uh, I was thinking if you have like, for example, consensus, consensus genome from maize mm -hmm. and for rice and say, soybean or other plant species, and then somehow it may be we have some ability to compare those consensus genomes rather than including all the things that are underneath those, you know, each species. Will that give some kind of better insight for comparative biology? Oh, that's really interesting. So basically make a consensus genome in maize. Yeah. Consensus and genome the, in rice. Yeah. Consensus genome in sorghum, and then take those consensus genomes and compare them to each other. Yeah. So yep. I mean, then we can actually move up to monocot, and similarly, we can move up to dicot, and then see. Uh, if, yeah, then it, then since all the diversity in each of those clades will be preserved, the likelihood of finding comparisons between these diverged species is, is greater. Right? Because it is going to be very uh, computationally intensive also in the long run. Yes. So, so, you know, this is, I thought if it is possible, perhaps we can go also on that route. At least That's, have this as an alternative possibility. That would be, it would be, it would be worth, I mean, I think it'd be worth trying. That's a really interesting idea. I like it. Um, regarding clade level pan genomes, I should mention that we have something along those lines for the legumes, I think about 13 species. This is from leguminfo.org. Um, via the genome context viewer. Uh, this is an application uh, that Alan Cleary developed. Um, he basically does dynamic alignments at the gene family level of all genes in the set of selected species and then provides a viewer um, in a window around any region you're interested in. Mm. Uh, so I'm just thinking about uh, nomenclature and so Bracky has uh, pan genome, soybean, maize, and then this clade level uh, at legume uh, on legumes. There's got to be more. I'm thinking of people that might want to work together to um, work on nomenclature. Well, I, isn't Arabidopsis doing something like this? Ava? Sorry, unmuting. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Arabidopsis has a large number of ecotypes sequenced, um, and they have been aligned. Um, so I, I guess I wasn't thinking of that as, you know, fitting into the definition of a pan genome. Uh, but, it, you know, it is in a sense. So yeah. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of, of the pan genome as being more of the, the graphical version of the pan genome that, that you showed in the talk. Because, um, yeah, anyway, so I guess it does exist. You know, there's the 1001 Genome Project for Arabidopsis. We don't have a lot of those ecotypes in, in TEAR, and we have not found a way yet to display that pan genome data in an efficient way. We only show it in terms of uh, polymorphisms relative to the Columbia reference right now. It would be interesting to see how many like orphan genes and how many of the different classes of genes there are in Arabidopsis versus um, other, other species. Yeah, I mean, it, pe people have certainly done that analysis. Uh, I don't have the numbers at hand, but. Okay, okay. And we certainly have nomenclature issues there as well, or we're struggling with that a little bit. 
Well, I was actually thinking uh, that it could be useful um, just to set up a BLAST data set of all genes in Arabidopsis, for example, uh, where in the FASTA header you could capture some of the information about the extent of that gene across all of the, the genomes, and, and the, the FASTA uh, sequence itself could be the consensus sequence. So you could, for example, in the FASTA header say, you know, you could capture for each ecotype whether it's present once, whether it's present more than once, for example, if it's a tan array or duplication, or whether it's not present, you know, with the uh, Columbia dash two because it's there twice, or you know, Landsberg dash zero because it's not in that genome. You, know. you could you could imagine sort of a compact format in the FASTA header that captures some of that information, and that could be useful uh, for people who want to blast and find out you know, uh, the, what genes match and how distributed they are across those genes. Yeah. Hmm. Lisa and others, I was wondering, do you know what your users want to do with the, the pan-genome information? So, there's, it seems like there's a couple different use cases. The, the low-hanging fruit, which you've already discussed sort of in your, in your gene page, is kind of an ortho group approach where you're doing it at the gene level and saying, okay, we know based on our, the way we computed the orthologs, and I'm calling them orthologs, I guess, centologs is what you call them, um, that so many exist, uh, there are so many centologs for this reference gene. And you could maybe do kind of an ortho group thing. But it seems like the users would also want to have a, a Synteny viewer, or a, uh, would they want to see a genome browser that would yes. compare yes. multi by multi comparisons? And that's always been a sticking point, right? So how to how to figure out how to visualize that? So so what is it that users are going to do with this? Right. So um, th as far as the browser, that's something I forgot to mention that um, we're working on. John Portwood. In Maze GDB is working on a pan genome um, viewer, Centene viewer, and uh, I'm not really sure how it's going to look. I'm assuming it's going to be similar to what Steve Cannon talked about in um, the pan genome viewer he explained for the legumes. Um, I mean, one one thing to think of too is um, <clears throat> these NAMs or these NAM founders are used in um, like mapping populations. So uh, one of the things that people want to do, of course, is, is connect uh, QTL information to uh, uh, regions that are sequenced that's shared across all the pan gene, all, all the genomes, uh, identify QTLs that are only, that are unique in some of the lines, uh, ask if some of these QTLs fall within regions that are show some kind of inversion or other um, uh, structural chromosomal uh, organization, um, and the viewer can help you with that if you can if you have a viewer that has all the the shared and not shared um, genes, and then if you can map where QTLs fall fall across all these, then you can easily. Um, you know, detect patterns um, between the QTLs and these uh, differences um, in presence, absence among the different lines. And, and okay. another way to say that is uh, genomes to phenomes, you know, lo lo looking at the diversity within a, a species and seeing which um, genes or parts of genomes are responsible for the different phenotypes. And I see this as uh, something that uh, people on the level of looking at uh, QTLs or association studies across whole genomes are interested in, but also that labs um, that look at individual genes, which when mutant give a severe or striking phenotype, individual phenotype that segregates three to one in a cell, you know, that type of old fashioned mutant. Um, it's nice if they can look at, um, if they've got that gene down to 20 genes, they can look on a browser or some sort of viewer and see the diversity within those 20 genes across, you know, 10,000 10, lines or something, and then try to 
look at those lines and see if they have any indications of similar phenotypes. So I see this as being used by genome biologists and people looking at the whole thing, and but also uh, people still looking at individual one, one, one gene or 10 genes. Right, okay. So with the genome browser issue, if that gets back to a file format problem then, which Maggie was describing earlier, like how would you, because um, you need to have a way to represent the sequence in a consistent way that a genome browser could actually read it. Right, so that gets back to, uh, so basically how we represent genomes in a, in a viewer format tends to be based on like a reference, right? And you have the coordinates of all the syntologs and where they map to the reference. Um, alternatively, uh, the example that Stephen used, I don't believe is dependent on a reference. And Stephen can correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, reference format is usually the way you can go about doing it. Uh, you could also have different browsers with uh, different references um, to show the alignment. But like you said, it's, this is something that um, gets very complicated very fast. And as you mentioned, it really is going to depend on, on how you're going to represent this, um, this format. Um, you probably can do an all against all alignment, but it would, but uh, it would be, based on region to region. And um, I know that this is something that uh, Grameen has, there's a pan genome viewer there where you, can, where you can look at that. And Doreen can correct me if I'm wrong about that. But uh, yeah, there's different ways of approaching this and just trying to find the, the way that's the most efficient, but also the most useful for our users is, is really the key here. Um, for the Legume Context Viewer, uh, which by the way is, I'm sure that uh, the NCGR Andrew Farmers Group would be happy to share that with anyone who's interested. It's on GitHub. But it's really quite an out of the box, outside the box um, solution in that the pan genome is anonymous. Uh, that, that is none of the, there's no consensus gene that gets named. And there's no structure that's stored statically to represent the pan genome. It's all calculated dynamically. Um, and I'm not the best person to represent this, but basically you first indicate a region that you're interested in. Uh, then genes within that region from uh, a species of interest are selected and then a search is done across all of the other genomes um, to find other regions that have corresponding sets of genes. And then they're aligned basically the same way a multiple alignment works, um, but aligning on gene families as sort of the alphabet as opposed to aligning on residues. Right. I see that Tanner has posted a link for a weak pan genome. Do you want to say anything about that? I'm looking at it. Well, uh, so there's a there's a paper that was uh, there's a link for the paper there. It's published by uh, David uh, Edwards from Australia. Um, there there are also other uh, pan genome projects uh, led by Chris uh, Curtis Pozniak in Canada. But uh, uh, the issue remains. I mean, here is we have a JBrowse uh, view, and essentially the the, the span genome the uh, is actually represented as a track. Uh, uh, still, the issue remains of how to visualize uh, these span genomes more accurately and more uh, in, in in views that are more informative.
Hi, uh, this is this is Andrew Farmer uh, from NCGR. So um, I've got Alan here with me. Um, and the way the way Stephen described our uh, context viewer is pretty accurate. I mean, one one thing that's kind of interesting about the approach that we've taken is that um, all of the genomes don't actually need to reside in a single site. It can kind of connect to services from different sites. And then a lot of the comparison uh, between the genomes is done kind of on the client side. So it gives it quite a lot of flexibility in terms of choosing, um, you know, to what extent you want to think about the, the pan genome as being within species or clade-based. Um, so we've, for example, we have uh, something on the order of 16 Metacago genomes that we have as a pan genome, and then we can connect those with uh, more distantly related genomes such as alfalfa or chickpea. And uh, it's, it's been quite useful for us. Um, so some of the use cases that people have described in terms of kind of trying to connect um, an understanding of, of gene level variation to uh, QTLs uh, are things that we've we've been able to connect it to other um, tools, basically, and, and achieve some really interesting use cases. For example, we have a um, kind of a cross-species GWAS um, application that's making use of the same services that the context viewer uh, is relying on and uh, kind of being able to look at cases in which similar traits have been looked at across species and, and seeing when, um, you know, similar sorts of genotype to phenotype um, relationships obtain. I think, I think we did present that application uh, to this group um, probably a, a year, over a year ago. Um, it's certainly evolved since then. And, uh, you know, as Stephen mentioned, the code is uh, not legume specific and available from GitHub and would be certainly delighted to see other people adopting it. I was just thinking it might be time for you to give us another talk <laughs> on this. Well, some use case examples are really nice. We will contact you. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, Lisa, I also put up um, a the link for the maize plant genome. Uh, Gramin, this is part of Gramin, um, is based on the Ensemble browser. Uh, we haven't dealt uh, directly with the issue, so the, the genes have been kept separate, um, but that same model has been used for uh, grape, um, rice, and uh, I, I'm not sure it's wheat. But we, that, that's how we, we have managed. For, for wheat, I know we have the polyploidy uh, views. Um, also, for uh, the gene trees, for the comparing across uh, orthologs across those pan genomes, um, Andrew in, and Andrew also in our group uh, developed this tool where uh, you can visualize, like from from all the species in a pan genome. Uh, how they compare, like if it, that's on a gene by gene basis. So uh, if you like, uh, I could ask uh, either Andrew or Andrew and Sharon uh, if they are willing to present. But I, as I said, this is not um, dealing directly with the issue of putting it everything in one browser. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been kept separate, but it's, 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 a, it's another aspect, it's another way that we have been trying to get the information and, and provide something that's also useful for the community. Yeah, 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 I think that would be good. Oh, I'm taking notes. So Marcella, what, what, uh, what viewer do you have? I mean, I know you use Ensemble, but what, um, to view the pan genome, the link goes to, uh, if you click on any of the genomes, for example, the PH207 or the W22 in that link that I put on the on the chat, okay, uh, mm -hmm. you'll be taken to the to the oh actually well you have to to click on an example that's the that's the species page, so you have links for other for for particular examples, you can either choose um, 
an example region or an example gene or one of the genes that are underneath that search box that says search CMAW22 on the left. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's how you um, would get some there. Of them, yeah, eventually we, you will get <laughs> the <laughs> ensemble process of you. Okay, okay, thank you. Sure. Lisa and Maggie, uh, this is Maze GDB curates gene function too. Have you, um, are you working on or considering curating the function of uh, just SNPs or indels in, in genes that are not within the B73 reference? And if so, how would you, um, like, so in your, in your gene, which is presumably reflects your database model, so would you, are you still curating the reference gene? Are you curating the, the SNP? Or are you curating the, the Syntelog? Am I making sense? <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, wow, I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure we've talked about it, the NAMs to this extent. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think in, in general, we have two sort of two approaches. We, if we learn anything about a gene uh, from a paper, we put that on the gene page, which um, our gene pages have genetic information and gene models and sequence information. And the genetic information would have information about that gene really from any, any accession. Um, and then, yeah, then we're figuring out how to do all of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I did want to put you on the spot. I was just, it just occurred to me that that might be um, interesting. <laughs> so. Right. No, you're right. I mean, getting yeah. back to what I was saying about the like QTL data and stuff, that there is data that's published out there on all that stuff in the NAMs. And if we can somehow integrate some of the genetic data into physical map data and then put them on the browsers, for instance, that would go forward in, in sort of connecting genomes to phenomes, as Lisa said. So... Yeah, but we haven't really, I mean, we're just trying to figure out the nomenclature right now and the gene model pages, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, we had 10 more curators. <laughs> that yeah, question right. made me feel so behind. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is Tanner Shan. Uh, so I think uh, we are in the beginning of trying to uh, understand how we can actually create a better pan-genome representations. Uh, if you think about it, right now, pan genomes are only based on a limited number of cultivars, for example. So what if, I mean, how will we actually integrate different pan genomes based on different cultivars? I mean, we need to develop uh, data representations that will allow us to do that. Because at one point, we will have, like, we have, we have the same situation with genomes. At uh, one time, it was just one genome one reference genome. Then we have multiple reference genomes uh, for, for a given species. Now we have pan genomes. We will have multiple pan genomes. So how will we actually integrate those? I think we should also think about it, uh, start thinking about uh, this kind of issues as well. That's interesting, because we're thinking about, for maize, we're, I think of it as one pan genome as we get more and more cultivars for Zia maize maize we uh, would add those to a single pan genome and we might go more clade more farther out to get some uh, teosintase in there. But you're right, we could have one maize and one teosinte pan genome. And, uh, but I like what, what, what Shushma said about a consensus genome. Maybe that would be a way to compare pan genome. A consensus genome could have uh, a consensus genes for core genes and dispensable genes and individual orphan genes. And we could use those as a basis to compare. But yeah, all things to think about. Um, I, so when you construct pen genomes, um, do you just go by the order of genes, like the component of genes, or do you even um, look for sequences? Like when you say, when you, um, constructed con con I mean, pen genome out of 60 cultivars. Um, so you add all the orphans and 
you know, that's, a, that's a, another giant issue. Oh, my God. No, I mean, I'm just like, so I, um, I, I missed a little bit in the beginning, but then um, you mentioned like, um, so there's a, there's a two ways you have reference genome and then you just compare all the other 60 cultivars. So that's how you represent, one way of representing it. But then also you can come up with pen genome, basically, like it has all the genes that you um, discovered in 60 cultivars. So then do you even look for SNPs or you just like, if they are close enough to call it as the same gene, um, you just come up with the genes. Is right. that the pen so genome? Yeah. Right. So it, there's there's different ways of representing it. There's at the SNP level, mm -hmm. within like shared genes, or there's like a larger level where you just look at presence absence of genes in a mm -hmm. way that, you know, kind of what Stephen was saying. It, 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 instead of like comparing on base pair, you'd be comparing the the, the unit wouldn't be ATGC. The unit would be that gene ID. The gene ID. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so, so, and I focused mostly on the on on the pan genomes based on uh, genes as a unit rather mm -hmm. than SNP as a unit. But, but yeah, that, that's a whole different type of pan genome that okay. can be represented to, and uh, so yeah. Okay, so we we do like synteny analysis like between closely related species and. Um, so pen gene, the difference would be in my mind, like in pen genome, you uh, construct a, I mean pen genome like that has all the genome, genes in it. Mm -hmm. But then if we do synteny, we just define, we just like uh, come up with synthetic regions where all the gene orders are similar, right? But then we don't necessarily come up with like ancestor genome or pen genome. Um, so pen gene the difference would be like i mean to display pen genome data i guess we could use a uh, synteny viewer probably because you can compare genes and all that but then additional data in pen genome analysis would be the actual genome that contains all the genes right right i think right go ahead, go ahead maggie oh, go ahead lisa well, I'm, I'm thinking of, t of two separate issues. There, there's also one of the reasons why we're using genes or SNPs. Uh, I mean, in maize, there's 95% of the, the genome is not genes that we know of. And so um, it's at this point, I think we're using the genes as a unit because that's so much easier, mm -hmm. even though it's still incredibly hard. So there is that, there is another layer of this that is comparing other parts of the genome that are not genes. Right. When you do pen genome analysis. Okay. Correct. Okay. Right. I mean, that, basically, that right? There, there's a different pan type of pan genome for every type of research you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody who's studying structural biology is going to want a structural genome biology, is going to want a pan genome that's way different than somebody who is uh, looking at uh, for QTLs or uh, like flowering time, okay? They're gonna be looking at things at the SNP level. Right. And the genome biologist is going to care more about large inversions and translocations across the entire genome. So those are gonna to require totally different approaches, I think, in creating the plant genome. And it's just one of the most important things is identifying what you're trying to do with it. And then that's going to help guide you in, in creating the plant genome and, and how you're you know, and whether or not the pan genome you're creating, like you were saying, is something that can be visualized or not. And if it can, how would you visualize it? So, I mean, um, in, this, in the chat right now, we have several different links to different ways of viewing a pan genome, and they're all relevant and they're all useful for certain things, but may not necessarily account for other types of information that you're looking for. So this is, this, that alone just sort of adds to the complexity of this, this whole topic. Yeah. Looks like we're past our hour. <laughs> <clears throat> Obviously a hot topic.
Yeah, thank you very much. It was a very good talk. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm very, I apologize again for the technical difficulties. So. Oh, no problem. We can deal with that. <laughs> and we do have a speaker for um, next, uh, next month, which we'll talk about the GEMS platform for, for breeding. And um, then we're, we are going to have a meeting at PAG together. We'll tell you more about that soon. And we are looking for more speakers in 2019. So if you'd like to talk, let me or Jackie know.